Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to our Sunday school lesson today. We're trying something a little different. We're going to make things easier on uh, everybody. So this will be Facebook Live, but then it will go automatically to Facebook. So if anybody knows anybody that wants to, to watch. This week we're in Acts still, chapter 8. We're going to focus on verses 1 through 8. 26 through 31 and 35 through 38. This is the Jerusalem church being scattered, is what we're going to talk about today. Verses 1 through 4. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So, as, as we've talked about the last few weeks, these are just a continual actions. This is not any time but between anything that we've study in one chapter, we go to the next chapter, this is just the next move, the next the next thing that's, that's come at him. And Saul was consenting unto his death. We're talking about consenting unto Stephen's death. Saul, Saul thought that was the right thing to do. I read something interesting from, in, in a commentary about, about Saul and his position. I'd always heard, read that Maybe Saul was a, um, a young student or, or someone that was just beginning to be a part of the Sanhedrin, but that he was, he was just there watching. He, he, he watched their coats because he wasn't participating in the action, but he was watching over their cloaks. But that he supported what happened, as it said here, that he was consenting unto his death. But I read where someone else said that Saul's position there was actually to oversee the stoning. That Saul was there to make sure things were done according to the law. To make sure that Stephen was stoned according to the law. And that almost that Saul was the one that was in charge of the stoning. He wasn't participating because he had to, to watch and make sure they did it properly. And so if you think of it in that term, <clears throat> you kind of look on Saul a little differently. And you look on the situation a little differently. When we get on down here where... It said it, it was a great persecution against the church, which was the only church at that time that was there in Jerusalem. And they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. So the, you remember there were thousands of people in the church, and a lot of these people had been there because of the Jewish festivals that required you to return to the town. So a lot of them now have seen that the Jews, the Sanhedrin, these folks are coming down hard on us, and and now Stephen's been killed. And that was Satan's attempt to destroy the church. And all that did was disperse the church. God used these actions to create what he, his will, to follow through with what his will was. They were not told to just create a church in Jerusalem and preach the word of Jesus, to preach about that Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They were told to take it into <clears throat> to exactly what this was. They were told to go into Judea and Samaria and all the world. And all their focus had been on Jerusalem. And now they're going to move forward with God's will when they were told to spread the word. And that's what's being done here. And then the devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. So the, the people, though, they immediately buried Stephen. They took him and they, they mourned over him. And they buried him according to the custom uh, immediately. And then as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Havoc is like people talk about you're like a bull in a china, club, I mean, I mean, in a china shop. Just destruction. You you, that's what they mean by havoc. I mean, however you could best describe someone trying to destroy something, that's what Saul was doing. That's the havoc that Saul was bringing. And he was entering every and everybody that they had a whisper of 
as being one of those followers of that man of Nazareth. Anybody that they even thought might have been, they, they, they didn't go get a warrant. They didn't knock on the door. They kicked the door down and they drug the people out and they took them and they put them in jail. Everybody that was a member of the church that stayed, that they could find, they put them in jail. Everybody pretty much had left other than the apostles. They stayed, but everybody they could find that there were citizens of the town, they, they took them and they put them in jail. And they stayed in jail until they could go before the Sanhedrin, until they could go before the religious court and do that, you know, again, they, well, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. They did the same thing. See, they took them before, threw them in jail, they took them, they were going to take them before the Sanhedrin, and they were going to tell them the same thing they had told the apostles, the same thing they had told them. You cannot preach, you cannot talk about this Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We're telling you, don't do it. You can't talk about it. That's their threat that they have been making to the apostles, and that's the threat they're making to the people of the church. And what do they do? They scattered abroad. They went, just as God said, they went to Judea, they went to Samaria, and when they got there, they didn't keep their mouth shut. They went and told the people what they had heard, what they had learned. They went and told people, just like the apostles were. Now you've got not just the 12 apostles, you got, you got a whole church full of people that are dispersed out into the world like missionaries. They're, they're going out in the world and they're telling everybody about it. In 5 through 8, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. So Philip, you remember, he was one of the original deacons as was Stephen. So Philip has gone down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ on them. Samaria, the area was called Samaria and the main city was called Samaria, just like New York, New York. You know, the state of New York and the city of New York. And Samaria was probably 40 or miles, miles or so from Jerusalem. So it's a pretty fair distance that he went. And he went and he preached Christ unto them. And you remember, this is an area where Jesus spent a lot of his ministry as well. This, the woman at the well, he preached. So they were there, and they were talking. Well, it, I'll let the author of our text here. He says, Jesus had won a Samaritan woman during his ministry. While Jesus was there, he said to his disciples, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. What Jesus was looking at and told the disciples to look at was all the many Samaritans that needed salvation. <coughs> Can we not look out into our world and see the fields are white already for harvest? He went to Samaria and he went to share with Jesus Christ and he went to an area that Jesus had already told them was ripe for harvest. They had already been, well, not particularly Philip, but the, the apostles had already been there and they had already witnessed this and seen this. And who knows how much the people there of Samaria had spread the word, but they were anxious for more news about this Jesus Christ. They were receptive to this. And the people with one accord gave heed unto these, those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. That's what you're looking for when you go to witness. They had, they had heard. They had seen a few things. They had heard a few things. They had heard these stories about the woman that well. They had heard about this Jesus Christ and, and about this living water that he said he had. They had heard these things and they wanted to know more about it. And when somebody showed up saying that they knew more about it, they lent an ear. They were ready to hear. They were ripe for harvest. And it said they were of one accord, meaning they were, they were all ready, just like we talked about one accord of the church. They were all thinking in the same way manner, and they were all receptive in the same manner. And Philip spake and hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. The reason he had the ability to perform these miracles was because there's a lot of false prophets at this time. And today we have God's Word. We have the Bible. We hear somebody tell us something, 
And what are we told to do? God tells us to take it and compare it to what he has to say. However you want to word it, whatever you hear, if you want to know if it's truth, you look to your Bible and you read in your Bible. And if it says the same thing in your Bible, then you know it's true. If it's not what's said, what God has told us in his word, then it's not true. It's, it's one of two things. It's what we talked about last week. You either make the right decision or the wrong decision. And you live with them. So it's either truth or it's not. And But they didn't have the Bible. They didn't have a completed Bible laying before them to, to hear what Philip had to say and think, okay, now let's see. Is he telling us what, what's written down here? Yep, he is. So, so he's being truthful. What, he, <coughs> what God provided in order for them to know that he was speaking the truth was his ability to perform miracles. That was his validation. Not God's word, but, but the performing of the miracles from the power that he was bestowed upon him by the Holy Spirit. It says, uh, Philip did not hesitate. Well, let me, sorry. <laughs> not get ahead of myself there. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. So when we're talking about the miracles he performed, he cast out a lot of demons. The many were taken with palsy. The, many people were paralyzed. He he healed them, and they walked again. And there were people that were lame that were healed. He doesn't tell us how many miracles he performed, but he performed the miracles everywhere he went and shared God's word and he shared about this Jesus Christ of Nazareth in this area that was ripe for harvest. And there was great joy in that city. There was great joy in that city. That can you? You know how excited everybody gets when someone joins the church. How that makes you feel inside. A great joy, and especially when it's when it's a young child, or if you've been in in the area of Awana when one of the children accepts. Jesus as their Savior, the great joy that that brings about. Just think about, and there was great joy in that city. Just think about a field that's ripe for harvest where hundreds of people come to know the Lord as their Savior. I mean, joy is joy, but this is just exponential joy is all I could imagine. And, that, and, and there was great joy in that city to know that you've got people of one accord looking to Jesus Christ of Nazareth that you've got you've got the growth of a new church you've got the founding of a new church here Satan thought he destroyed the church in Jerusalem that church lived but those people went out and planted new churches those people went out in the world just as God's will was and started new churches great joy in the city the, the church in Samaria actually says here was the second church in existence. It says the persecution on the Jerusalem church not only brought salvation to many, but it was also the means of starting many other churches. This was just the beginning. Satan and the Sanhedrin looked at it as the end of the church, and this is nothing but the beginning of the church. And then we move on to verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So now, Philip is in Samaria. And he's in this area. He's, he's just, we can only imagine, people, all the, continue, all the people coming to know Christ as their Savior. And the uh, and the angel of the Lord comes to him and speaks to him. I don't know that there was any other time prior to this, did, but an angel of the Lord spake to Philip. Now, how, would, how would that make you feel? You know, a lot of times in the Old Testament, whenever an angel of the Lord showed up, the first words out of the mouth was, don't be afraid. You know, fear not. Hang on. But then say that here. It just says an angel of the Lord spake unto Philip. I don't know if, if, if he looked on the angel any different than 
folks in the past had or if if the angel presented himself in a different manner, but apparently Philip was, to me, so engrossed in what he was doing and, and the work for the Lord. An angel showed up, he didn't expect anything any different. Well, of course an angel shows up to talk to me. We're out here harvesting. He, he wasn't he wasn't told to be a, be not afraid. He wasn't told to fear not. The angel came to him and told him, Arise and go to the south and goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. Okay, you're working here. I've got another place for you to head to. Now, we're talking about, it's not like jumping in your car. I mean, we talked about the high-speed chase. They went from, from downtown Malvern to 430 in just a few minutes. That's, I don't know, 50, 60 miles. He's 40 miles from Jerusalem, and, and Gaza is another 50 or 60 miles southwest from there. So he's probably 80, 90, 100 miles away from where he needs to go, and he don't have any type of high-speed transportation. He's got his feet. So he starts hoofing it. He doesn't say, well, I need, I need a chariot, or I need a camel, or I need a horse. I don't, he doesn't. He just says, like, it's just, okay. And he arose, and he went. And behold him, he arose, and he went. He just, all right, that's where I'm needed next. Here we go. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for worship. This is interesting when you start thinking about this person that he's, that he's going to see, that the Holy Spirit is, is sending him to see. First of all, he's from Ethiopia. Ethiopia is 1,200 miles away. Ethiopia is on the south side of Egypt. A long way to go. A long way, a long way from home. And he's a he's he's a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. So he works directly for the queen. And he's a he has great authority. And he's traveled from Ethiopia to Jerusalem, and he's on his way back. It, it says he was he was 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 returning and sitting in his chariot. So he had gone to Jerusalem for you know we just had the three fe the three main festivals that Jewish that the Jews are, are expected to return to Jerusalem for. You have Passover, you have Pentecost, and you have the feast the festival of Tabernacles. And it doesn't specify if he was there for one of these or all three of these or what. And it doesn't specify that he was a Jew. But what he is, is he's a person of high authority from Ethiopia. It was known in that time that there were Jewish people scattered out throughout the world that were advisors to different rulers in different countries. This guy might have been born a Jew, or he probably was just in the queen's court and had got to know one of these people. Jews that was there serving the queen as well. And he, he, the more he learned about it, he felt the urge, he felt the pull to go to Jerusalem for these festivals. And he was in charge of her treasure. <clears throat> this is not just somebody that worked for the queen. This is a guy that's got, that holds the purse strings. So if you got the person that holds the purse strings, you probably aren't letting him travel by himself. You've probably got a pretty good entourage with him. You've probably got some folks with him that are guarding him, keeping him safe, because this is an important person. <clears throat> it's pretty important that, that the person that's got charge of all your money is well taken care of. But he had gone to Jerusalem to worship, <clears throat> and he was returning, sitting in his chariot. He read, he, he's reading Isaiah the prophet. Now, interesting thing here about Isaiah is this is the one book in the Old Testament that has the most prophecies about the Messiah. This is the one book in the Old Testament that talks most about Jesus Christ. And then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. So the, the angel of the Lord talked to him a while ago when he was in Samaria. And now the Holy Spirit's talking to him. 
And he tells Philip, go up there to that chariot. You need to go up there. Well, he's just a simple man. He's in a strange area. And here's somebody of, he doesn't know who this guy is. But he knows he's of some importance. He knows he's, this guy's got to be, he, he knows he's a foreigner and he knows he's important because he's got all these people around. He's riding in a chariot. I had to walk here. This guy's riding. And he's got all these guards. And the Holy Spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran to him. You remember when you study about David and Goliath? And they did all their trash talking. And when the trash talking was over, how David approached Goliath, how David approached what God willed for him to do, how David approached what his next step was to be, he didn't walk up there. He didn't gingerly wait to see what Goliath was going to do. He ran to Goliath. That's what it says in our Bible, that he ran to Goliath. It's the same thing here that, that you see what Philip is doing. He didn't approach cautiously because these guys got some big long spears and swords and I need to just ease my way up there and say, hey, by the way, you know, I'm, I really haven't, I got an appointment with this guy. I need to go talk to him. Would you mind letting me buy or whatever? No, he ran. It says that he ran to him. He had faith that God was going to take care of him. He knew that this was what God has appointed him to do next, was to go talk to this guy in the chariot. And he's so excited to do what God has next for him that there ain't no time, no time to waste. Let's go. And he ran to him. And he heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou read? He ran up to the chariot and he heard the eunuch reading aloud and reading in Isaiah. Now you wonder, if I'm riding in a car or I'm riding in a plane and I'm got a book with me, I'm not reading it out loud because the person next to me is going to get bent out of shape. You know, you, if you got two kids in the back seat playing games, they got to have headphones on so they can play their game and not make any noise unless the other one's going to get mad because they're interrupting their game. We always have to do things quietly and to ourselves, we think. Well, if you went and looked at how manuscripts were written in this time and place, it was like a giant run-on sentence. No punctuation whatsoever. All it is is a collection of words. And it was common practice at this time when you read something, you didn't read it to yourself silently. You read it and sounded out the words and you read it so that you could hear it and make it fit conversation so that you could figure out where one sentence and statement ended and where the next one began. So you read it out loud. He wasn't reading to the chariot driver. He wasn't reading to the soldiers next to him. He was reading it so he could understand it. And since he was reading so that he could understand it, Philip was able to know exactly what he was reading. And that's when he walked up to him. And, and he said, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand it? And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So here's a man from 1,200 miles away from a totally different culture reading something about the Jewish nation, reading prophecy about the Messiah that's coming from the, from the Jewish people. This Messiah that's going to save the world. And he's reading about this. And somebody comes up to him that looks to be probably a local and asks him, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? If you go and say to somebody, do you understand what this is? Do you understand what you're seeing? Do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand what's going on? You take it that they do, and they're just asking you if you need some help to comprehend it for yourself. And that's what Philip is offering up here. He's asking you, do you know what, what you're reading? And he said, well, how can I unless someone guides me? How can someone get somewhere where they've never been unless somebody that's been there themselves shows them the way? Unless someone guides them there. We can't take someone someplace that we've never been ourselves. 
So he can't have somebody that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior to explain to him what Isaiah is saying. He couldn't have someone from the Sanhedrin court explain to him what Isaiah was saying because they didn't believe in this Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But here we have Philip, who the angel told him to go down there and who the Holy Spirit had led him to go and speak to this man in his chariot. And he desired Philip that he would sit and, and talk to him and tell him about this. And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. The folks that didn't know Jesus Christ didn't know what Isaiah was talking about. But Philip climbed up in the chariot and sat down beside the, the guy from Ethiopia and said, yeah, I know about what Isaiah is talking about. Isaiah talked about this fellow 400 years ago. Isaiah is talking about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and I know about it. I saw him. I've been there. Let me tell you what Isaiah is talking about. I've got first-hand knowledge because I've been there. And he preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now he's probably, he had spent some time in Jerusalem. And he probably had heard some things. And he had heard enough about probably John the Baptist and about Jesus Christ baptizing people once they had been saved. And he knew about this. <clears throat> and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. He followed through what Jesus Christ had said. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He understood what Philip said. He understood that this Jesus Christ had been talked about for hundreds of years. He understood that he was the Messiah that they had all been waiting for and looking for. And he accepted that Jesus Christ was his Savior. And at that point, that's when he's asking, well, <coughs> what's stopping me from being baptized? And Philip said, not a thing. <laughs> Making that public profession is the next step. Telling people that you are saved. Telling people that you, you know, your salvation is between you and Jesus Christ, between you and God. Between That's a private thing, your salvation is. But to let everybody else know is the next step. To make that public profession. So that when the Holy Spirit tells you to approach this person that you think is unapproachable and to share with them Jesus Christ because they're searching, he approached this guy and this guy was looking for answers. Just like the people of Samaria. The field was ripe for harvest. This guy was looking for answers. And can you imagine... This all started because Satan was trying to shut down the church and we've gone now to Samaria and, and into Judea and sharing the gospel and then the next step was into all the world. Here's a guy that is high up in the government of Ethiopia, 1,200 miles away and what do you think he's going to do when he gets back? You think he's going to go to his boss, the queen, and say, yeah, the trip was pretty good. I enjoyed it. I'm tired, man. I need to go rest, though, because I'm tired. No. He went back, I promise you, and started saying, let me tell you what happened on my trip. Aren't we excited when things unexpected happen in, this, in the stories we give and the excitement that we share? Because, well, you, you got to... I went to expecting this, and guess what happened? And, and then it just goes from there. God takes it and runs with it because we've made a public profession. We let people know that we're Christians. And then somebody somewhere is is moved by the Holy Spirit and and they're wondering what's going on and they want some answers and they, you know what? I know this person over here. I know they're saved. I, I know they're a Christian. 
because uh, I've heard them talking about it before. I bet they got. I bet they can point me in the right direction. And then they go to you and they start asking, or you see the, f- and and you know that their ears are open and they're wanting and seeking answers, and that's when you can. Unsolicited advice just falls on deaf ears, but when they're looking for answers, they're they're going to absorb everything you share with them. It says it was of no coincidence that this man was reading the most powerful prophecy about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament and that Philip came to him with answers as he read. It's no accident when somebody crosses your path and they're lost and they're looking for answers and you've got them because you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. That's no accident that y'all's paths crossed. That's God's will. And all he's looking for is for us to step up and follow through. For us to not be timid. For us to be like David. For us to be like Philip. For us to run at the opportunity. Run to the opportunity. Not away from the opportunity. To run to it. It says in the application here, we are called to be witnesses and only God knows how he will guide us to our next opportunity to witness. It might be at a neighborhood meeting or working in a vacation Bible school. It might be teaching a Sunday school class or working at a local restaurant. It might be intentional or accidental. That's to us. It might be intentional or accidental to us. It's never accidental to God. Just want to clarify that there. There's nothing that happens by accident. Nothing catches God by surprise. However, the key for us is that we are ready at all times to share the gospel with everyone. Everywhere we go, let us preach the word. And he said unto them, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If God so chooses to bring suffering into our lives to get us out of our comfort so that we will work for him, so be it. Let us not make comforts our idol. If we are living for our possessions, our hobbies, or our entertainment, we are living for the wrong reasons. We are to live for God and tell others about Him. I encourage you today to take the time to prepare a gospel presentation. And then I am certain that God will give you the opportunity to use it this week. That's what the author tells us here. Be willing and do it. That scares some people. That scares all of us. To to prepare ourselves. And then we... We got the answers. We got the word. We we want to prepare ourselves. Paul Buck talked to teenagers several years ago about share Jesus without fear. This is it's a it's a it's a progression of verses to go down through and and to read. And you just it's a it's not some secret. It's it's an easy way to get it started because so often we don't know how to take that first step. We're supposed to run up there. Well, the very to run, you got to take that first step wherever you're running to. So, how do I take that first step? Well, a good manner is to, to do this little thing that share Jesus without fear. And all you simply do is turn to this first verse that he talks about. You turn to that verse and you hand it to the person that's asking you about it, and he asks them to read it, and you ask them, "What does that say to you?" And whatever their response is, you can tell them what it says to you. And then you lead them, that leads you to the next verse. And there's six or eight verses as you walk through it. And, you know, I hate to say it, Paul did that several years ago. And it's amazing to watch it and to see it. He even, I've even got a little Bible that's easy to carry in your back pocket. And all the verses are marked. And, and he even went down through there and said, so now you, you highlight this verse, and the next verse, you use your little marker, your little ribbon in there to start with, and then you write it upside down because you've got the Bible facing that person. And so then the next verse is you write it on the top here upside down so you'll be able to read it because they're looking at it. You'll be able to read and know where to turn next. And you just walk through all these, and you got them all highlighted and everything. And that Bible set on my table for several years. Now, I still haven't found the right opportunity, but I'm telling, I carry it with me to work every day now, and I'm just waiting for that person to say something 
and, and give it a try. And I don't say that to say that I'm doing anything right or better or anything else. I'm just, I know that I fail God all the time. That I'm not taking advantage of every opportunity that he puts before me. But I also know that I need to, I can try a little harder each day. And there's tools that, that he gives each and every one of us. And this is a tool that I was given a long time ago. And uh, I happened to be thumbing through Pike's Bible the other day, and he still got the little card, too, in there. I haven't asked him, but, but if you're interested in that, just Google, share Jesus without fear. And I'm sure the little steps will pop up in the verses. It's just one more way to start. If you're looking for some way to open the conversation when somebody says something. But the main thing is, be willing and do it. Don't walk away from that opportunity. Run towards it. Because as it talked about all the joy that came upon the church where all those people accepted Jesus Christ and the joy we feel when someone accepts Jesus Christ in our church. Don't do it for our joy for seeing this. Do it for their joy. The joy that they experienced. Do you remember the joy you felt when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And the joy of knowing that you're going to spend an eternity in his presence. The joy you feel each and every day when you know that this crazy, decrepit, broke down world is not all there is. That this is, this is just a temporary thing. This is just something that we have to pass through. The joy that we know the sun will come up tomorrow. And the joy that we know to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. That's the joy that we want to share with those around us. And with that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning so thankful. Thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thankful, Lord, for your word. Thankful for the opportunities that you put before us to share that word, your word, and to share Jesus Christ of Nazareth with all of those around us. I just pray, Lord, that each of us are prepared and, and take on these opportunities with excitement, knowing the joy that will be brought upon the others that we share your word with, our Savior Jesus Christ with. I just pray a blessing on the church and, and that you would continue to lead Mount Zion into our community as we share this with those around us and through the ministries of Mount Zion. And I just pray, Lord, that we'll start each and every day seeking your will. I ask forgiveness for our failures. In your son Jesus' name we pray.